So welcome everyone. Oh, I hear a dog in the background. I love dogs. Sorry about that. <laughs> my dog is my best teacher. So for those that don't know me, my name is Stéphane Leblanc. Three and a half years ago, I was inspired to create the International Center for Conscious Leadership. So my mission is to create safe spaces to transform as leaders and contribute to the elevation of consciousness and, and humanity. It's something uh, I'm really happy to say every day. I didn't know 10 years ago I was going to be doing this, but it's nourishing my soul. And on my journey, I, I meet extraordinary people, the people that have joined us today, but also three guys that I call brothers, you know, brother from another mother, because I'm much closer to them than I've ever been to my family. So I'm happy to welcome here uh, them with me to speak about speaking truth to power, you know. So I'd like to... Uh, introduce them and maybe ask them to uh, brief us briefly on who they are and and why they have a right to talk about speaking truth to power. And, and then we're going to talk about the subject. So as I always honor our, I guess I'm going to say elder, uh, I'm going to start with Eric because I consider him a very wise man and he's one of my mentors. So Eric, would you would like to start? Well, I think everybody has the right to speak truth to power. Otherwise, they're in trouble. Um, I've been a clinical psychologist for 36 years. Um, I figure I've spent over 30,000 hours with people. Um, I'm also an organizational consultant. And I use theater um, to reflect back the stories of groups and organizations to tell the truth, because theater functions as the fool. You can, you can put things on the stage. The fool can tell the truth to the king without getting beheaded. And theater and storytelling can have the same function. So we are, th this, this topic is dear, dear, dear to my heart especially right now. Thank you, Eric. I would like to invite uh, my dear friend, Graham, who's joining us from uh, England to share a bit about himself. Thanks, Stefan. Well, good evening, everyone. It's evening here in England. Um, yeah, I think it's, it's interesting. I, I liked uh, Eric's start. Uh, everyone has a right to speak truth to power. I'm sure we'll share some stories later, but it's been a very lived experience for me uh, since since childhood. And uh, I guess if I was to summarize what matters most to me is to close the gap between what people say and what people do. And that felt like a life's work. I started in hospitality where creating a customer experience was the reason people came back. Um, and I feel the same way about leadership. The experience you create as a leader is why people want to work with you and why they come back and work with you for years. Um, so as I say, a matter true to my heart, I work now in organizational consulting, primarily helping organizations find purpose and supporting that with the culture and capability to deliver the strategy that they're trying to um, bring to life. So I'm very much about bringing it to life. I'm very much about storytelling and I use those techniques to help leaders uh, and senior teams to create better cultures for which their people can thrive. Thank you, Graham. Thanks, Stefan. Thank you. And I'd like to invite uh, my friend Arnaud, who's joining us from the Netherlands. Thank you, Stefan. I think there was some feedback, not, not with my computer, okay. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, good evening from the Netherlands, uh, good afternoon or good morning for wherever you are. Uh, my name is uh, Arno, um, born in the Netherlands and uh, after university flown out. Um, I've lived in Latin America, um, Africa, Middle East and uh, I've been working in uh, over 25 countries so I'm fascinated with cultural differences, uh, both organizationally as from a nation point of view. I'm the founder and CEO of Parisian, and that 
comes from the word parisia, which means to speak your truth from your heart and with courage, humility, and firmness at the same time in service of the common good. And I dedicate my professional and personal life to help people take off their masks and uh, speak their authentic, genuine truth. Um, my, my slogan in life, uh, among others, is that it uh, is not safe to speak, and it will never be safe to speak, but it will be even less safe to not speak because we will get sick over time. So in this way, I, I seek to help leaders through individual work, could be executive coaching, could be work with grief, could be energy work, organizations, and now upcoming also uh, gradually more and more importantly, uh, societal change. So that's me, back to you, Stefan. Thank you, Arnaud. I'd like to explore with um, my guests here, um, speaking truth to power, Eric mentioned in, the, in his brief introduction, it, it's more important than ever. Uh, in our society. So maybe Eric, I'd like to go back to you and, and maybe share, you know, what, what does it actually mean to speak truth to power and why is it so important? Well, <clears throat> you know, we think about because the leader or the other person needs to know your truth. And if they don't like your truth, um, they can have all sorts of reactions to it. I mean, we are still uh, in this country in a place where a leader clearly doesn't want anybody to tell him anything that he disagrees with. And that is unbelievably toxic for any group. Um, you know, I was raised by uh, a father who became an entrepreneur and was very much a truth sayer and believed in telling the truth and encouraged me to tell the truth to him, although that was unbelievably hard because then uh, a series of questions ensued. Um, so it's, it's not easy to tell the truth, nor is it easy to be a leader or a partner who encourages the truth because the truth uh, is unsettling, but without the truth, we have no trust and without the trust, we, we can't move forward. Um, and this applies to relationships of all kinds, including intimate relationships. Can you tell the truth to your partner? Because in our intimate relationships, um, you know, there's all sorts of unconscious things going on and we need to surface those so they get out of the way and stop disturbing our relationships. So all we may talk more about organizations today, uh, the same rules apply to intimate relationships. Because when I speak to Amelia, you know, I'm speaking to a woman, a powerful woman who I want to be close to and I want to love me. So all my old issues can come up if I'm afraid to tell her the truth. In fact, our relationship was based on the, the first principle is we tell each other the truth. And that is not easy sometimes, but it's important. Thank you, Eric. I'd like to move over to give Graham, you know, for you, from your point of view, why is it so important to speak to it to power? Uh, well, I'll, uh, I'll always come at it from, um, from a values perspective. Um, I guess once we are really clear on what matters to us and where we need to be to feel safe, um, to feel fulfilled, to feel that we're part of something, I mean, we're talking organizationally here, then I think speaking truth to power is when you give voice to your values, you give voice to what matters, which then means you're acting in a place of, of integrity and authenticity. Um, echoing, of course, everything Eric said, power is, is not always the person who in an organizational sense is necessarily your direct leader, as shall we say. Um, power comes in many forms, again, as Eric's alluded to. But I think it's really important. It's a decision everyone has to make for themselves. And again, it's not easy. And the consequences are significant. I'm sure we'll talk more about that. 
But I think in a nutshell, yeah, it's giving it's giving voice to your values. That's what it means to me. I love that. Thank you. I'd like uh, to ask Arnaud to maybe comment on that. Why is it so important, in your point of view, to speak truth to power? Thank you, Stefan. Um, yeah, I, I resonate with uh, what, what Eric and, and Graham said. In my view, double-clicking on the word consequences I just heard in Graham's last sentences. Um, I've, I've gathered so much evidence now in my life, in my own life and life of clients and in my relationships that if we don't, um, our body starts protesting in a very subtle way first. Um, and over time and time, the more we ignore what's true in our body, we get sick. And um, I believe this is uh, incredibly important in these times where we all have been pushed into a river. Um, and it's now about swimming. It's now about spiritual practices um, in, in, in agility and bringing that to the organizations, but also to our lives at home uh, with our loved ones um, and, our, and our friends. Now, with that comes for me, something really crucial is how do I know I speak my truth if I do not completely know myself, if, if I am not completely conscious? And, and what does that mean? When, where does it start? Where does it end? Um, what are my blind spots? So how well do I know myself? And, and how do I scan and tune in with my body and how does it manifest when I'm actually off track or getting into incongruence or into inconsistency, which immediately will have an impact on efficiency and effectiveness in boards and leadership teams, for instance, so from a work perspective. But of course, as, as, as Eric and um, Graham also mentioned, it reflects everywhere in all our relationships. So for me, this is the time, this is the era for self-regulation to really come home in ourselves and to learn how, that, how to do that. Mm. Thank you, Arnaud. I'd like to, um, to maybe explore a bit um, what are the risks of actually speaking our truth to power and, and what are the risks and consequences of not speaking our truth to power? Maybe I'll go back to Eric. <laughs> well, <clears throat> I'm, I'm a pain in the ass because, as as Stefan, Arno, and Graham all know, I just you know, I, I I don't have Graham's British civility, <laughs> <laughs> and um, so I'm 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 a disruptive person. So starting with the fact is how do I get people to tell me the truth? Because I, I can be pretty rough and tumble. And I have to, if I ask for the truth as a leader or as a partner, I have to be willing to create an environment where it becomes perhaps somewhat easier for people to tell the truth. And I've had a number of instances where I've gone into workplaces and said, well, you know, I'm, a, I'm an ask for forgiveness, not ask for permission person. And if you don't like what I'm doing, tell me. And the number of times I find out that people are talking behind my back and stuff like that um, is a lot. And, you know, we're, we're not, we're not um, conditioned, we're not taught to tell truth to power because often, because that's what happens in our families. And children suffer consequences if they tell the truth to their parents often. And we, we keep going back to that, you know, that's where we replay in our work environments, our family environments. Um, but, you know, the last two times I've worked for somebody else, I work for myself now because the only boss I can deal with is the guy in the mirror and he's pretty judgmental at times. Um, I, I went in right from the beginning saying, look, I tell my truth. So if you don't like that, 
don't bring me in here. Don't hire me. And people said, oh, that's fine. We like to hear the truth. And in two instances, the last two times I worked with or, or for somebody else, I was let go. Not because of performance issues, but because I said things to the leader that the leader didn't want to hear. So there are profound consequences for telling the truth. And in both of those cases, it was very difficult and disruptive in my life. But ultimately, over the long term, it was good for me to be gone. And um, yeah, so I, uh, I was raised that way. I try to live that way. I try and modify my own. Mm, Amelia helps me because she she reminds me that <clears throat> maybe I can say things in different ways, and so does Graham, and and so do Arno, and so does Stefan. I said, you know, take a little bit of a chill pill, dude. Um, but you know, the the short term consequences of telling the truth to power can be very bad. You know? you look in the current government in the United States right now, everybody who's told the truth to the leader that the, they, the leader didn't want to hear have been fired, including one two days ago. So, and I consider that fascism and I don't want to have anything to do with an organization or a leader that functions that way. So when I look for leaders of organizations that I'm going to work with, that I want to work with, I have to, in my heart and soul, I have to believe that they can handle truth to power. Thank you, Eric. Maybe Graham, you can share uh, your point of view about risks yeah. and of, of doing it yeah. and not doing it. Uh, yep. Uh, well, I, I learned, I, I, yeah, I guess the very first uh, memory of really speaking truth to power is my first day at my, uh, what, I, what you might call senior school. I've been about 11. And um, I hadn't quite understood the whole system, how that school worked. I'd gone from a small local school to a, a large boys school, 900 boys, all aged from 11 through to, through to 18 and going off to university. And uh, I had no idea of a prefix system or any of that at all. And on the very first day, I, I, I expressed an opinion to a prefect who promptly buttoned up my blazer and hung me on a, on a peg um just hung me on it and said well you know because i was like a little uh like a speck of something under his shoe and he just hung me on the peg and i couldn't get off and a couple of guys it was my first day sort of unhooked me um and and i guess the truth the truth to the truth is that we don't always speak truth to power in order to survive and to get by um and i think that's that's one of the issues of that's one of the the risks and consequences so I think it's very easy to sit here and be idealistic. I think what we're, what we're really asking ourselves is, and I think Arno touched on it, is what's going on inside of you if you don't speak your truth? What's beginning to happen to you? Um, and, and, it's, and it's true to say that, that uh, through our careers, we, we sometimes are, maybe we are um, a little less truthful. We couch the way we express our truth in a way that gets um, us through a situation. But ultimately we have to face, as Eric said, the person looking back in the mirror and ask ourselves, what's the cost? So the consequence isn't just the consequence of being fired. I, I left two organizations because I hated the culture. And in one occasion I went home to my wife and said, I think I've just basically resigned because I told my immediate uh, managing director that uh, I didn't want to work for him anymore because he was divisive. Um, it took me a long time to get to the point to say it to him, but I did. And when I did, the relief was incredible. But I knew I'd resigned effectively. And he would then just, uh, in the way that Eric's talked about, who we know who we're talking about, just removes people as a consequence. But ultimately, my values were, I, I do not want to run my life like this. I do not want to work for someone like this. So there's a choice. Um, and it's not easy when you're the father of two you have a mortgage, you have a life, and you've got to go home and tell your wife you've effectively just resigned because you told somebody what you really thought and was the truth. So um, it's a choice. I said it earlier. Everyone has to make that decision for themselves. I think there's ways of doing it. Maybe we'll come to that. But 
risk and consequence. Yeah. Thank What's you, the Grant. price you're prepared to pay? Yeah. Thank you. Maybe Arnaud, you want to share a bit about that? Yeah, sure. Um, the most um, striking experience uh, I've had in my life was when I worked as a sales director uh, in a pharmaceutical company. And I was in charge of a couple of countries in Latin America, Middle East, and, and uh, North uh, French speaking Africa. And um, I had two bosses um, the global sales director, who was based in Holland, and uh, the senior vice president for the region, and they hated each other. So I quickly became, uh, you know, the. Um, the, the you say that the, like the cheese in the in the sandwich you know? and uh, I got I got um, I got in this uh, uh, sales conference call uh, the question of one of them from Holland the guy in Holland uh, you, ha you have to sign these papers by the way you have to sign these off you're the only one who hasn't signed them off and it was about replacing five people uh, who were my my IT backup guy the five people in Mexico City who would be replaced to to Roseland, New Jersey, and I and I didn't understand the move, and and I was actually coming from fast moving, and 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 I was trained in numbers games, so I didn't see the numbers game, I didn't see the business case, and I was like getting really weird, um, wary feeling, and um, long story short, it was about this global sales director who was creating a reason for him to move to Roseland actually to fire these five people and uh, bringing on top lots of uh, organizational trouble for uh, Spanish speaking and Portuguese speaking Latin America. So I said, I don't see the numbers game and I don't see the business case. So I'm not going to sign. And that evening I got a phone call from one of the general managers. Uh, this guy was based in Venezuela. And he said, look, Arno, you are now right in the middle of the career track of uh, Jean Paul, this guy. So either you sign this off or you actually, you know, you have to suffer the consequences. So that night I, I wrote my, my letter of resignation of exactly one sentence. And next day I went to my boss in the office in Santiago de Chile, who was the regional guy. I said, Tony, this is happening. I, I'm, I'm sure you're aware. Yeah, yeah, I'm aware. And I said, so do you have my back? And he, and he started to play his violin. And I said, well, you know what's happening. Well, so I gave him the letter and I said, look, give me the, give me the package, you know, give me three months, help you find another person. I can't do it anymore. I can't stand the face of myself in the mirror anymore um, for many other reasons. But that was for me, the last one. And um, so, and, and I decided to stay in, in that country uh, totally unprotected financially with the family as well, but I just couldn't do it anymore. So the highest risk for me, and this is just um, a figurative, this is, this is an example to, to underline what I want to say as the biggest risk is, I think we have a job here to do uh, in the 3D world, and that is to become the man or the woman we can become and to face that person at the end of the road. And, and if there is a big difference, I think we have done a lousy job. So my goal in life is to make that difference as, as little as possible. And, and when I meet the man um, I could have become and I am, when those two meet, I hope that that difference is, is really, really small. And I think that has to do with the choices we make every, every single day. So that is, is what it means to me. Mm. Thank you, Arnaud. And before I ask, ask the next question, I wanted to share uh, two, two things from my past. I have a strong background in aviation. I worked in aviation for uh, 20 something years. And, uh, you know, in the US at the NASA, they lost two space shuttles. And, and one of them is actually documented, the Challenger. There's actually a movie about it. It's a very old movie where an engineer that worked at the, uh, the subcontractor that did the joint, you know, that held the fuel tanks together, uh, raised his hand and says, we've never certified uh, this joint uh, at, you know, the weather that they're about to take off, you know, 
tomorrow? He says, we don't know. He says, do you know for sure it's unsafe? He says, no, but I don't know for sure it's safe. And we're talking about eight lives here and seven lives. And so he raised his hand and he, in the movie, it's well documented. He actually fought with his boss and his boss's bosses. And they went all the way to NASA and the mission control specialist or whoever was in charge challenged the company and says, are you sure? Are you put willing to stop the takeoff? And the, the general manager of the division said, no, we're not. So he overruled his engineer and we had a, you know, explosion. So it was a, because I'm an aviation guy, I saw this happen every day in aviation because we're talking about lives. And, and without naming names, there's a big company in the US that builds planes that starts with a B, <laughs> it's called Boeing. You know, they, they certified a plane that was unsafe and I don't know, 300 people died and $10 billion later and losses, they're having to face the fact, you know? So I think in, in many cases, uh, Eric mentioned the psychological aspect and, and what's going on in the US. And, but I think in every country, uh, in every company, there are people that are not speaking their truth and we end up doing things that are not doing so well. And it, it's, I guess it's something that I really care about because we keep making cereals that have 50% sugar. We keep selling medication that have side effects and, and someone somewhere didn't speak their truth. So I just wanted to mention that. Um, maybe uh, we can ask um, some field experiences here because we have here uh, three people and I include myself with a lot of experience in the field uh, as leaders, but also advising leaders in many capacities all around the world. I'd like to hear some field experiences about speaking truth to power. You know, we, we share some of our own experiences, but maybe of the people you advise, you know, we, we don't have to name them and the company, but Eric, maybe we can, you know, the, you know, live experiences of what happens, you know, with some people when they speak their truth to power, the positive aspect too, because in many cases it's, it's completely transformational. Yeah, I think, I think it can be. Um, and when people don't have practice speaking truth to power, they become more afraid to do, it. you know, if I'm, if I'm working with an organization and I'm, uh, I'm encouraging, um, people to tell truth to power in the organization, I am also assessing whether or not I'm assessing and talking to the leaders about how to respond to that truth when they come in. I'm not going to set somebody up to get fired. And if I'm coaching somebody where I'm in an organization where I, I'm not connected with the leader, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to go through all the risks. And I have done that a lot under those circumstances. And, you know, some of my clients, fully knowing that that might be, you know, the end, have spoken to truth to power and, and gotten fired. And, you know, this happens in family businesses and things like that, you know, um, whether the younger people can, really speak up and, and, and get a voice. Um, so I would say there's all, I, I, in my, I'm, I'm assessing my own risks all the time, but when I am coaching people and mentoring people, I'm also, you know, assessing the ground. Um, you know, I'm involved with a, what's called the big black man project right now and interviewing um, black men. And believe me, a black man who gets stopped by a, a police officer in the United States better not speak truth to power. There's a huge risk. And I just did an interview with a man the other day who's been stopped by cops in our area over a hundred times and never cited for anything he's just stopped for being black so there are situational circumstances like if you're a jew in weimar germany you don't go up to the guy with the swastika on his shoulder and say hi i'm a jew um so there's, there's a lot, there's a lot of situational stuff. Um, and, 
Um, you know, when I when I speak my truth in the field to people, I'm also assessing whether or not I believe people can understand my truth. It's my truth. It's not the truth. It's my truth. Are they, do, do they have the consciousness to understand what I'm talking about? So. Mm, thank you, Eric. Maybe, Graham, you can share a bit of uh, field experiences yeah. with the people you advise. Yeah, I, I, I might go in a different direction um, to give some mm -hmm. contrast. I, I think I think one of the things we have to be conscious of is that um, there's there's a there's a way in which people stay in power um, and they create such an environment. I guess some of the things Eric's alluding to, but uh, and and in order and in order to step out of that, not just means you have to go as an individual and speak truth to power, but you're then shunned by the community that you're part of as a result of that. And I and I've seen that happen a lot. It's this moment where almost the the community rejects you as you not only are speaking truth to the individual let's say with whom you have major reasons to to call it out but when you do the community rejects you as well there's kind of a double whammy and um i've become very conscious i've been coaching a uh, working with a leadership team where if, if i was labeling and judgmental um, in order to illustrate the point that the leader is aware of what he does and how he behaves, but is incapable of tackling it. it, it it's almost uh, a willful blindness to not tackle the very thing that he knows. He's conscious that he does it and he creates a, a, a real inability for any any sort of psychological safety to happen in the team. And what happens as soon as someone has, or in the past, spoken out in 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 the wider, and there is no member of the leadership team in this in this uh, company that has lasted more than eighteen months to two years. They get to the point they want they they speak up and they go. And, and I think we just have to be really conscious of that. So again, to Eric's point, in coaching or in advising, I think it's really important that we uh, try and find a way where there is, a, if you like, a consensus, a way in which a team of people can go to the leader as a group in, in a really structured way and find a way to approach the individual concerned so that they can they can meet this issue rather than go alone. It's not always easy to go alone for those reasons. So I think... Uh, that's a very real experience for me right now with, with, with someone I'm working with. Thank you, Graham. Arnaud, would you like to chime in a bit on this? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, building, building on, on Eric's and Graham's contribution, what comes to me is the word self-protection. Um, when I work with um, clients, be it uh, individually or teams, um, I can be pretty harsh and firm and pain in the ass sometimes, at least that's what they tell me sometimes. And, um, and I tell them upfront uh, that it's not always going to be fun, but it's going to be um uh, transformative and healing and um, often I find them coming in dilemmas so if I say this then that happens if I say that then this happens so then they they actually don't really know how how to go from there and sometimes I see myself going in the same path and then I uh, seek to help them uh, up chunk in their values. So what's the value clash here? And um, if, if that's not possible anymore, or they got really stuck, there is always a way to express that part, to express, you know, I'm stuck. And I, there is something really important for me here, guys. 
maybe in front of your team. And um, I don't know how to say it. I see myself stuck. I see myself in a dilemma and I, and I don't dare to say it. Or somebody else I've coached just recently. So yeah, when I, when if divorce and I and I you know I can't afford to to be laid off. Um, so then I ask them, okay, so what stops you from them uh, sharing that part and and tell them? there to say it and or this, this is of course my words right now but there is always a way to express what's really happening in in the how and not that necessarily in the what so not necessarily if if there is insufficient between brackets courage slash vulnerability which is the, the, which are the two faces of the same coin if if people are still evolving in those two values and I and I understand that that's happening then I invite them this this third wave for now and and that is um, often not always a way of ventilating the energy and of giving it a, a place giving it space um, to get it out of their system at least and to and to have that set right there and that's like okay can you do that yeah i think i can do that and they find their own words it doesn't have to be in the words i'm now sharing it can be in their own way of course mm. thank you arno i i want to share another personal experience uh, i think graham in the beginning I talked about uh, living our values or i can't remember the words he said but that's what i heard so there was a moment uh, in my career uh, in 2014 where our company was going through a severe restructuration, which means firing a lot of people. And, and, and I was managing the most profitable business and, and I was asked to fire 200 people. And within a week, it became 250 just because that's what was needed to make the numbers, you know, didn't make any. And I was sitting in an executive committee with my president and my colleagues and, 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 and everyone beside me said, yes, we're going to do what you ask. And I said, no, because if I do, I will actually make less money for the company. And my boss looked at me like a, an affront, you know, like I was confronting him, which I was. And he looked at me trying to, just with the eyes, trying to make me retract. And there was a bigger force than me that said, no, I'm not going to do it. And then he banged on the table and I won't say the words because it was in English, everyone will understand, but it was big swear words. And, and you know, meaning that if you do it or you don't. And I said, I'm not gonna do it because I will make less money for the company. So, and then a week later I was fired. But I knew when I, when I it was a force bigger than me, you know, Graham, the value just came out of me, you know? And today I'm, I'm happy because I sleep well at night, you know, because I live my values. And I decided not to be a yes person to do something because, you know, someone talked about the Jews before and, and, you know, I'm not judging what happened in Germany, but at some point in the food chain, as we say, someone forgot to say, I'm not going to do certain things, you know, and I think in companies, we need to do that more often. So, so I wanted to give my example. And, and as we have a, a lot of beautiful people with us, I would like to maybe uh, open the floor, you know, and, and, and allow people to ask questions and share comments and, and share what, what they feel about what we've talked about, you know? How does it resonate with them? Do you have your own field experiences to share? Do you have any questions for us? How can we make this uh, interactive for the next 15 minutes? Who would like to go first? You, Amelia. Hi. I'm curious, you know, Graham used this term psychological safety, creating psychological safety, but from the perspective of the person giving truth, and it seems to me, there's a part of me that wants something a little nuts and bolts in this, like, because obviously I agree, like, yes, we must speak truth to power, but how do you create the conditions to also create a certain kind of psychological safety for the leader to receive the power, or to receive the power, receive the truth? Um, 
And I'd be curious to hear that. I mean, I'll say one little thing I learned. I took a respectful confrontation class and I got critiqued um, by, because I had a tendency to like build up my courage and then speak my truth but without any kind of tuning in to what's going on with the other person. And one of the phrases from this workshop was, everyone can handle a lot when their nervous system has time to adjust. Because of mm -hmm. course I'm ready to speak my truth, but this other person isn't necessarily ready to hear it. And just, I've noticed even with Eric, checking in is now a good time to yeah. talk about <laughs> as reduced arguments by like four <laughs> So I just, yeah. I would love something a little nuts and boltsy about how to create those yeah. conditions. If any of you have anything to share. Yeah, <laughs> I, I really like that, Amelia. Um, and I think you've nailed it um, in that, um, again, at no point do I want to appear idealistic and, and we're in the real world here. Um, but I think what the point you're making is, is is now a good time is a great one. But I think the other one is, what is it? Uh, oh, look, in an ideal world, I would, and uh, you know, we, we're all saying in a different way, it would be great if leaders said to their people, I need some truth tellers in my team. Who's prepared to, you know, I, and I want to, I want to lead like that. Well, we know that's the ideal that doesn't happen. So the other way is to say, what is it that we can learn and see in the leader that we recognize matters to him or her in their values, in the way they behave, in what stories they've told us? And by asking questions, learning a bit about them might give us insight and a way and an approach of speaking to what we see as their values or what matters to them as a way, as you're suggesting very beautifully, is a way in under the radar of building confidence that you're coming with them in peace rather than in aggression. Uh, again, that, that's an approach I've seen used and I um, discuss with those people who are trying to tackle something. Where's the, where's the landing point? Where's the bridgehead or the beach that you can begin on and climb up? Well, I, th I think Amelia said, oh, yeah. it, said it also is that, you know, back to the person's autonomic nervous system, if a person is calmer and not in a state of arousal, they are not going to get triggered so easily. And this applies to groups. When I worked with executive groups, uh, there was one time I brought in an automatic blood pressure monitor and had them put it on in the meeting and their blood pressures were going through the roof because they were talking about difficult issues, but they're used to covering it, especially men, you know, covering it up. So. Not only do individuals, uh, pairs, couples have to have agreements about when's a good time to tell the truth. And Amelia made mention, we've had a few times where she's wanted to tell me the truth. And, you know, I need, I was getting stuff down the line. I, I, I didn't want to hear anything disruptive at that moment. And she's gotten amazing at asking me can I hear something that she knows might be somewhat unsettling to me? Um, and I think that's a good thing for all of us and a good thing for executive groups or groups of people to have agreements of how are we going to agree to be when we get into difficult issues? Because a group that can't discuss the difficult issues, especially now, is not going to survive. They're not going to be resilient. They've got, to, they've got to deal with all sorts of stuff. And my model, the opposite of the current person, Abraham Lincoln of the president of the United States, there's a book written out called Team of Rivals. And he, he brought people into his cabinet who fundamentally disagreed with him and each other. And he would get them all in a room and they would just sort of go at each other's ideas and he would listen and then come out and make a decision so eric when you were speaking about lincoln someone else used lincoln yesterday maybe it was you in our call and i watched a movie and it touched me it reminded me uh i was i was too young then but there was a leader in my province the prime prime, prime premier there was a famous statement someone when he was being criticized he was just saying you shut up you shut up it was like a dictator even in, uh, in my country so the, the, he was just like at the extreme but 
you know, Lincoln is a long time ago. You know, how do we go back to that? How do we go back to to LT debates? You know, not just in the U.S. Uh, in Canada, we have so many challenges too. So, uh, it just made me think about that. Well, he was the first Republican president, so you know, they. Yeah. The Republicans might think about going and looking at their roots and seeing what those values were. <laughs> Thank you. Would someone else have a comment or a question or anything to say? What's your experience with speaking your truth? Hmm. Hmm. I want to I want to give another example field experiences that I faced uh, when I was in aviation. I had a, a client who was also an aviation company, same company I talked about before, and they were they had a new airplane program and they were convinced that within a week it was going to be the first flight of that new project, which was you know fifth ten million dollar pro ten billion dollar project. And do you know when the first flight actually happened? two years later so there was someone in you know in engineering the vp or something that that actually believed it was going to happen within a week so and you know there's thousands of engineers working on a project like that so and then they had a complete restructuration of their culture because their culture couldn't handle the truth so when an engineer would come with a problem he would be going back with his tail between his leg and and be told no we we only accept solutions here but so it's, there's severe, severe consequences, you know, monetary, health-wise, not just with deaths, but health. Of, uh, of, and I think it, it's structural. It starts with the very, very top in many, many cases. I, I guess you could say the same thing happened in Germany with Volkswagen and the diesel engine. You know, I'm sure all the way to the top, it was known. So just wanted to mention that, you know, it's... Uh, well, the dynamic... Go on, Eric. The dynamic that you're talking about happens in all sorts of groups, whether it's groups of men or groups of women or, or families and stuff like that. Everybody is afraid to challenge the current story that's, that's there. Yep. And the truth often challenges the ongoing story. And yep. And in, now, especially, challenging the ongoing stories probably going to helpful to be resilient, right? Um, you know, people on Thanksgiving in the United States now, they're not getting together with their families, but we always get together for Thanksgiving, you know? We, have, we need to have the freedom to get together to be with our families over Thanksgiving. Well, you know, maybe there's another story. You know, maybe you need to be free not to kill each other, so... Anyway, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm intrigued by, I mean, I'm, I'm, there must be people who are here tonight with their own stories. I, I, I would very much like to hear them. But I think this point of, um, without trying to be controversial, but we see now so many organizations being exposed. We've touched on a few. We've talked about the aviation company, talked about Volkswagen, dare I say, uh, the Catholic Church and so on and so on and so on. These things are known. We know what's going on, people know, but stepping out and speaking it and saying it and pointing out to it has such consequences that it really is easier not to be rejected by the community you're part of and just to go along with what goes on until one day something comes out, we Harvey Weinstein and so on and so on. Um, my, my greatest hope is that, that uh, is that we build, once we see, I think it's perhaps, become, I'm interested in what people's view are. Is it because we people get away with it, that they're not brought to account? And when they are often, inverted commas, justice doesn't seem to have been done or doesn't seem to have been commensurate with what's happened. Um, it's an interesting one. It goes right back to, I mean, Eric talks a lot about this, you know, First Nations, the things that have gone on that have just been allowed to have happened without consequence. So I'm, I'm really interested in this space that we're all watching emerging right now in the world, whether it's presidents or leaders of other countries um, or large corporates. It's systemic. Daniel. Go ahead, Daniel.
you're on mute. <laughs> Danielle, you have to unmute yourself. Okay, yes, I just did. I appreciate everything you're saying right now. I think it is immensely valuable. It is a form of um, personal development, leadership development that is just never talked about. And I find it not just timely uh, because of this absurd political situation we find out find ourselves in in America, but also in different places around the world. Having said that, um, my difficulty is dealing with people who are in power over situations who are immensely immature in their own development. And therefore, any sort of even trying to create a psychological safety net for them to hear what you have to say, saying it as gently and uh, as possible so that it's received as compassionately as possible is just too much for them. And, um, and I know this from personal experience. Uh, I worked in a, uh, I ran as CEO of a organization that um, the board of directors, everybody in the organization had to have experience to be hired into that organization and was tested and proven and except the board of directors. And the board of directors could be almost anybody. And um, there is little um, uh, vetting of those people. And so a lot of them, the only real power or authority that they felt they had in their life was being on this board of directors. It was incredibly difficult to deal with them. And, uh, and the consequences were, I got uh, laid off. Uh, for speaking gentle truth to power about where the organization was. And so uh, I, I just find this, and you're all addressing it, and I appreciate that, but I find this conundrum, this, this, this dilemma of, and yes, it is, those of us that are trying to always walk their spiritual truth uh, and be compassionate to others in the process, wherever they are, in their process, uh, you know, there is this, what it comes down to me, I've had this conversation going on in my head for decades. I've been teaching um, leadership development to large organizations for a long time. Um, evil can come in because they have no values, because their value is to survive and overtake, can come in and just crush good. And I don't know, and I search and look diligently for how do you deal with that? How do you be a good in the world when there is evil that is so threatened by anything good? Mm. Mm. Thank you, Daniel. Mm. We have time for one last comment. I think we need to answer that question. Yes, please. Yeah, I was going to yeah, say. Go ahead. <laughs> Graham, answer his question. Yeah, well, no. Well, I guess. I, well, okay, let's let's have a go. I won't, I won't talk for that. What's interesting is that it takes time, but you, you might argue, and I don't, this is a terribly sensitive subject, and I'm, and I'm an English friend. But you have rejected that one of those individuals two weeks ago. And Volkswagen were exposed. And uh, the aviation company were exposed. Yep. And Belarus, the people are on the streets to expose what's wrong. We've seen the Berlin Wall come down. I guess if you stand where we are now, Daniel, and look back 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, and all some of us have worked that long in this call, I guess we have seen something shift, but your point is really well made. And again, I'm anti-idealism, but if we look back, it is moving. When Jessica Arden in New Zealand was landslide victoriously re-elected, the first thing she did is go to her supposed enemies and say, come and sit in my government with me. The people she just trounced, she invited into her cabinet. 
And I think that's the leadership we're looking for. And that's the role modeling we're looking for. And I, my optimism and my belief in, in humanity is that eventually good will see through evil to your, to your excellently made point, Daniel. And I'll stop talking there. No, I mean, I think, yeah. I mean, sometimes it takes a long time. <clears throat> and you have to have allies and you know yeah. i just was i was just listening to dan your situation where you're trying to you're a ceo of an organization and your board hasn't been vetted it's like oh my god what a nightmare well i guess you won't ever be a ceo of an organization again where the board hasn't been vetted and they're your allies the board's supposed to be helping you <laughs> <laughs> You know, so, uh, but it does, some of this takes, takes a long time. Thank you. Yeah, my, um, my reflection would be um, to uh, maybe chime in on your question, Daniel. Um, two things. One, um, when I see uh, something like happening, um, I, I, I try to meet them where they are and really go into their pain and be with them in that pain. Um, and it means for me to, when feeling that, talk like them, speak like them, walk like them, dress like them, become one of them for a time, ask questions. And at the same time, um, it's also expressing my truth with them, what I'm willing to do differently. I, I think there is um, no such thing as uh, darkness or bad being bigger than good. I think it's always in balance. I think it's in ourselves uh, all the time. And I think it's about making conscious choices. Where do I want to operate from? And um, we, without the bad, light can't exist and the other way around as well. So I think it's about, for me, it's about um, understanding them, where they come from. I've been working in, in moments in my life, in, in corporate life, where it was very dark, very, very dark, especially in the pharmaceutical time. Um, it was money everywhere and like shitloads of money everywhere. And how the relationship of people with and to money blinded them. And... Um, I learned there to, to see and feel the suffering um, and now being able to go there as well, if I want to or not, and concentrate strongly, okay, given that this is happening, what is it what I am willing to do and take a stand in life no matter what, including the self-protection. Stefan, you uh, wanted to continue i think oh thank you um i i i'm you know i i just want to echo what eric said uh, my view in society is uh, we have a, a lot of discounting on integrity you know integrity as a basis doing what's right for the right reason is very much discounted not just in politics i think i know in it's not just in pharmaceutical there's a lot of money it's, it's very often money Will drive the choices, decisions. We saw it in Wall Street 2008. We'll see it in the next financial crisis. And and uh, but I, I I'm finding in my own life that everything that's out of integrity eventually comes off to the surface at some point. You know, people get caught, and it just takes time. And uh, and I think speaking truth to power, if I can conclude uh, our our event today, it's very very important for us as individuals. It's very important for our organization and our society. It takes a lot of courage, but that's the life a lot of us have chosen to live a life of value. And eventually, by speaking our truth, uh, we actually become agents of change in our organizations and our society. So 
I just wanted to say that uh, in conclusion, I want to thank my guests from, from Netherlands, from England, from Massachusetts. And I want to thank all our guests that jo decided to join us today at lunch. So thank you so much, everyone. And uh, we wish that you speak your truth to power as often as you can at home, <laughs> at work, and in our society. Thank you so much. <laughs>